Welcome to Lesson 4 of BL 101, New Testament Greek for Beginners. Lesson 4 primarily focuses on the second declension Greek noun, order of words, and the movable new. Today, we'll begin at paragraph 25 of Machen's text. Paragraph 25. There are three declensions in Greek. Now, a declension is the variation of the form of a noun, pronoun, or adjective by which its grammatical case, number, and gender are identified. The second declension is given before the first for purposes of convenience since it is easier and has a larger number of common nouns. Therefore, even though we do have three declensions in the Greek, don't worry about the first or the third declension. Right now, we're just going to focus on the second declension, just because it's a lot easier to deal with. Paragraph 26. There is no indefinite article in Greek. So, autophos means either brother or a brother usually the latter. Greek has, however, a definite article, and where the Greek article does not appear, the definite article should not be inserted into the English translation. Thus, autophos does not mean the brother. In the plural, English, like Greek, has no indefinite article. Anthropoi therefore simply mean men. It does not mean the men. Now before we go any further, let's stop and take a closer look at the Greek noun. In our previous lesson, we looked at the verb. We learned that the Greek verb contains tense, voice, mood, person, and number. But the Greek noun is different. First off, the Greek noun contains gender. The gender includes either masculine, feminine, or neuter. The Greek noun also includes number. The noun's number will tell us whether it is singular or plural. But there's a third element in the Greek noun. That third element is called a case. Greek cases include nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and vocative. Paragraph 27. The noun in Greek has gender, number, and case. There are three genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter. The gender of nouns must often be learned by observation of the individual nouns. But nearly all nouns of the second declension ending in os are masculine, and all nouns of the second declension in on are neuter. The gender is indicated in the vocabulary by the article placed after the noun. The masculine article ha indicates masculine gender. The feminine article Hey, feminine gender, and the neuter article, ta, neuter gender. Paragraph 29. There are two numbers, singular and plural. Verbs agree with their subject in number. There are five cases, nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and vocative. 
Now, I remember back when I was a first-year Greek student, uh, I came upon the Greek case, and I realized I had to learn the Greek case. And to be honest with you, it terrified me. I never took a foreign language. I didn't know what cases were. And it really caused me a lot of consternation as a first-year Greek student. Now, if you've taken a foreign language, probably several of you already know what cases are. That's fantastic. But this next section here that we're going to stop and take a pause at, this section is for those students who's never taken a foreign language. They really don't understand what a case is. And my goal here is to alleviate the stress to help you to understand what the Greek case is. We know that the Greek noun contains a gender, masculine, feminine, neuter, and a number, singular and plural. We're going to now look at the case. The nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and vocative. To understand the Greek case, let us take a step back and look at an English sentence. A very simple English sentence. Uh, the sentence we're going to work with is, the man threw the gift. In elementary English, we learn to break a sentence down into a subject and a predicate. We knew the man in the sentence was a subject. The verb, threw, is there, and the predicate is the gift. This is all, everything we sh you should have learned by now in basic English. Now we're going to take a look at a Greek sentence. Ha anthropos bale tondoron. The man, he threw the gift. This is also the subject, the verb, and the predicate. But in Greek, we don't use terms like subject and predicate. Instead, we use a nominative, the verb, and the accusative. The nominative is the subject of the sentence, while the accusative is the object of the transitive verb. Oh yeah, ballet? That's the transitive verb. The genitive case is where the noun expresses possession. We have a sentence here. The man threw the gift, but we add a genitive to it of the temple. So we now have a sentence. The man threw the gift of the temple. The temple possesses the gift. The key word there is the word of. Keep in mind, the genitive case expresses possession. The dative case expresses an indirect object. We take our sentence, the man through the gift, and we add a dative to it, to or for the girl. So we can say the man through the gift to the girl. That to the girl is a dative. We can also translate that as the man through the gift for the girl. That phrase, to or for the girl, is a dative. Girl is the dative. It's the indirect object, with the key words being either to or for. Last, but definitely not least, is the vocative case. The vocative case shows direct address. So instead of saying, the man through the gift, I would say, John, throw the gift. I am talking directly to John. It's a direct address. So that noun, John, would be evocative. So let's summarize the Greek cases. First we have the nominative. That's the subject of the sentence. The accusative. It's the direct object. The genitive. It expresses possession. Key word of is of. 
the dative case shows the indirect object. Keywords for that, two or four. And finally, the vocative is the noun of direct address. So the, I think of the word, the, the uh, title, John. It's a title or a name, vocative. So let's get back to Machen. Paragraph 30 once again says that there are five cases, the nominative, the genitive, the dative, the accusative, and the vocative. Paragraph 31. The declension of Anthropos, ha, a man, is as follows. In the singular column, we have the nominative, it's Anthropos, a man. In the genitive, it would be Anthropu, of a man. The dative, Anthropo. Notice the Yoda subscript. That's ah, a little flag that says, hey, look at me, I'm a dative. Uh, if I see an omega with the Yoda subscript, most likely that's a dative. Anthropo, it's two or four a man. The accusative, anthropon, a man. And then we have anthrope, man. It's the vocative. In the plural, the nominative and the vocative look exactly alike. Anthropoi, men. Plural genitive would be anthropon, of men. Anthropois, two or four men, dative. And then finally the accusative, anthropus, men. So here's the declension. It's the second declension, masculine, ha, a man. Paragraph 32. The student should observe carefully how the principles of accent apply to this noun and to all the others. In oral practice and recitations, the stress and pronunciation should be placed carefully on the syllables where the accent appears. Okay? Paragraph 33. The stem of a noun is that part of the noun which remains constant when the various endings are added. So the stem of anthropos is anthropo, and all other second declension nouns like anthropos have stems ending in omicron. The second declension therefore is sometimes called the omicron declension. But this final omicron of the stem becomes so much disguised when the endings enter into combination with it, it is more convenient to regard anthrop as the stem and os, u, o, on, e, or etc. as the endings. It should at any rate be observed, however, that omicron, with the long of it being omega, is the characteristic vowel in the last syllable of the second declension nouns. Paragraph 34. This is on page 25 of Machen's text. The subject of a sentence is put in the nominative case. Thus, anthropos gnoske means an apostle knows. The object of a transitive verb is placed in the accusative case. Thus, if we have blepo lagan, that means I see a word. Paragraph 35. The genitive case expresses possession. Thus, lagoi apostolone means words of apostles. Or we can also translate that as apostles' words. But the genitive has many other important uses which must be learned by observation. The functions of the Latin ablative are divided in Greek between the genitive and the dative. Uh, 
don't let that confuse you. Let's just focus right now on the genitive case expressing possession. Paragraph 36. The dative case is the case of indirect object. Thus, lego lagan apostolois means I say a word to apostles. But the dative has many other important uses which must be learned by observation. Thank you, Mr. Machen. Paragraph 37. The vocative case is the case of direct address. Thus, Adolphe, Lepomen, means brother, we see. In the plural, the vocative case in words of all declensions is in form like the nominative. The vocative plural may therefore be omitted in repeating paradigms. Paragraph 38. Learn the declension of logos, ha, a word, and of doulos, ha, a servant, in paragraph 557. These nouns differ from anthropos only in that accent is different in the nominative singular, and therefore the application of the general rules of accent works out differently. Let's take a look. Here's paragraph 557. The declension of logos, ha, the stem is laga, and a word, anthropos, so we have logos here, we have anthropos, we also have doulos right here. Uh, they're different because remember, while all the Greek words follow the general rule of accenting, these nouns are not fully recessive like a verb. Now the verb is a fully recessive, and if we look at like anthropos, it goes all the way back to the antipenult. Uh, you'll see them act a little bit differently though, because remember, accents land as far back as the nominative singular will allow. Well, that complicates things at times, uh, not necessarily with logos and doulos, but care, bear in mind, for instance, do loss has a circumflex. Well, why? Well, remember, the Omicron is short, and if it only goes back to the penult, and that penult is long, then we can place a circumflex. Okay? But if we see the word dulu, you see dulu right here. Well, the ultimate is long, therefore the penult cannot have a circumflex. It takes an acute. Same thing with do low. But do lawn, the omicron is short. The omicron upsilon diphthong is long. Therefore, the penult can take a circumflex. And these are things that you're going to have to recognize. You have to work on. Um, just go through this. Be a little bit careful. You'll pick it up easily enough. And I shouldn't really worry too much. Okay, that's paragraph 557. So it says these nouns differ from anthropos only in that the accent is different in the nominative singular and therefore the application of the general rules of accent works out differently. Paragraph 39. The declension of huios, a son, is as follows. Huios, nominative. Huiu, genitive. Dative is huio. Accusative is we on, and the vocative is we yeah. In the plural column, both the nominative and the vocative is we oi, the genitive we own, the dative we ois, and the accusative we use. Bear in mind, the we os is a beautiful example there. The accent in the nominative singular only falls on the ultima. Therefore, the accents on all of the cases of that noun, huias, has to remain on the ultima. And we can see it right there. Okay? Paragraph 40. 
Here the rule of noun accent decrees that the accent must be on the ultimate in all cases, because it was there in the nominative singular. But which accent shall it be? The general rules of accent answer this question where the ultimate is short. For of course only an acute, not a circumflex, can stand on a short syllable. But where the ultimate is long, the general rules of accent will permit either an acute or a circumflex. A special rule is therefore necessary. It is as follows. In the second declension, when the ultima is accented at all, it has the circumflex in the genitive and dative of both numbers elsewhere, the acute. Ooh, that's a good rule. I would put a box around that if possible. Let's see if I can do that. I'll put a box right there. That is something that's very good to highlight. Okay? So in the second declension, when the ultima is accented at all, it has the circumflex in the genitive and dative of both numbers. Elsewhere, it's the acute. Explanation. Well, the elsewhere really refers only to the accusative plural. <laughs> Because in the nominative, the vocative singular, and the plural, and in the accusative singular, the general rules of accent would forbid the circumflex, the ultima being short in these cases. Hmm. Paragraph 41. The declension of Doron. Ta. Notice the article ta tells me that that's a neuter. While this is a second declension, it is a neuter second declension. So the declension of Doron, Ta, which is a gift, is as follows. Both the nominative and the vocative are the same in the singular, Doron. The genitive, Doru. The dative, Doro. Oh, look, there's a Yoda subscript. That is a good clue that that's a dative. Then you have Doron, the accusative. The plural looks just slightly different. Both the nominative and the vocative have an alpha, Dora. Genitive, Doron. Dative, Dorois. And finally, the accusative plural, Dora, with the alpha. It will be observed, paragraph 42, that Doron is a neuter noun. In all neuter nouns of all declensions, the vocative and the accusative of both numbers are like the nominative. And the nominative, vocative, and the accusative plurals always end in a short alpha. Paragraph 43. This is the bottom of page 26 of Machen. Now we're going to deal with the order of words. The normal order of the sentence in Greek is like that in English. Subject, verb, object. There is no special tendency, as in Latin, to put the verb at the end. But the Greek can, in fact, vary the order for purposes of emphasis or euphony much more freely than the English does. Thus the sentence, an apostle says a word is in the Greek normally apostolos lege lagan but lege apostolos lagan and lagan lege apostolos are both perfectly possible the english translation must be determined by observing the case endings not not by observing the order Okay, this is important. You will find a lot of times in the Bible when a word wants to be emphasized, the author will take that word and throw it at the beginning of a sentence. Just because it's at the beginning of a sentence doesn't mean it's the subject. You have to look at the case endings of the nouns. Very important and very good. You'll stumble across some real nuggets, gems where the author is emphasizing a word 
over something else. But anyway, let's continue on. Finally, last paragraph of the lesson. Paragraph 44, movable new. When the usi of a third person plural of the verb comes either before a vowel or at the end of a sentence, a new, we call it a movable new, is added to it. Thus, blepusin apostolus we have. Sometimes the movable new is added even before a word that begins with a consonant. Thus, either luusi dulus or luusin dulus is correct. It must not be supposed that this movable new occurs at the end of every verb form ending in a vowel when the next word begins with a vowel. On the contrary, it occurs only in a very few forms which must be learned as they appear. So when you do your exercises, which I hope you will, we have paragraph 45, the exercises coming up. Uh, let's see what else we have. Yes, paragraph 45 are your exercises. Um, don't be fretted if you find a new at the end of some of the verbs. Um, it, it's called the movable new. Speaking of exercises, paragraph 45, we have uh, Greek to English in Roman numeral 1. We also have English to Greek in Roman numeral 2. Um, if you would for homework, stop and go through this. This will stretch your brain. This will help you learn the lesson a lot better. And um, let's have you translate Roman numeral 1, the Greek to English. Okay? If you have any questions, drop me an email. I'm here to help you. I'll be glad to help you any way I can. If you want, rewind the lesson. That's the great thing about having it on the internet. You can always rewind the instructor. Take it several times to help you understand lesson four. Next week, we'll go over the lab and we'll go over the homework. Thank you.